Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sue Pigden. On behalf of um, Noreen Crucial at the Bushfire CRC, we um, welcome you to what is now the fifth of the webinar presentations that we started at the end of last year. Uh, the webinars are really aimed at supporting the adoption of new research amongst ACAC member agencies. And so far, we've reached uh, approximately 300 people um, through the webinar series, which is really um, pleasing. Today we're hearing from Drs. Chris Weston and Luba Volkova from the University of Melbourne. Um, they've spent their last three to four years of their life leading research in forest carbon management and bushfire emissions, comparing emissions in low, uh, low intensity prescribed burns to bushfires in the um, Australian forests in southern and southeast Australia. Uh, just before we start, some basic information. Um, Chris and Luba will be very happy to take questions at the end um, of their presentation, which will run for about 30 to 35 minutes. In the bottom left of your screen, there is a free text box. And please, please feel free to type in a question at any stage of the presentation. Hopefully you don't forget, but um, they'll be looking at the questions as they, they come through. Um, a reminder too that the webinars are also being recorded and will be up on the ASAC and Bushfire CRC website um, by the end of this week, Monday at the latest. So thank you, um, Chris and Lieber, welcome, and um, over to you. Thanks very much, Sue, and uh, for that introduction as well. So the format of the webinar today is that uh, I'll probably do most of the talking through around about 20 or so slides. And Luba will be here to, um, to deal with questions and to uh, uh, keep me honest when I drift off the track. Uh, the, uh, the slides are numbered up to 16, as you'll see in a moment. So uh, if you're getting nervous about how long it's taking, you'll know where we are from the numbers on the slide. They end at 16. So um, what we're going to do today is to try to summarize for you some of the main aspects from our study of the impact of planned or prescribed burning in the um, dry sclerophyll forests of southeastern Australia. And this is a project that uh, began back in 2011. And if some of you recall the weather back then, uh, it was uh, a wet year. And while we set out to measure the forest predominantly in Victoria and uh, some of the near states, we ended up moving to Queensland and Tasmania and South Australia to be able to uh, get to the burns that we needed to, to measure, measure the impact. So our study uh, very quickly became a study across southeastern Australia. So a little bit of overall perspective to start with. The um, forests uh, in a global context are important in the carbon cycle, uh, in particular because uh, forests exchange a lot of carbon dioxide with the atmosphere every year. We can see this in the interannual variation in carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. And um, <clears throat> because forests exchange so much CO2 with the atmosphere, they're important sources and sinks of carbon. And our interest in this project was to try to put some numbers around the emissions uh, uh, from forests from due to burning and to uh, try and predict some of the impacts of different fire regimes on the overall carbon balance of some of our eucalypt forests in the southeast. So I've made some points there on the slide that show you that some of the biggest challenges that we're facing uh, as climate change uh, proceeds is dealing with the increased risk of fire in eucalyptus forests and the recognition that we need to manage fire to minimize some of the uh, carbon emission outcomes that are possible through uh, a greater number of wildfires as a result of uh, more extreme fire danger days and a greater risk of wildfire in the landscape. So you can see there on the bottom right that the, uh, I'll put in this slide, in this uh, uh, box down here, that mega fires in Southeast Australian forests have been extensive over the last 10 to 12 years. And as we will also get to at the end of this presentation, these fires can release uh, an amount of carbon and as carbon dioxide that is equivalent to 10% of Australia's national emissions. So you'll see over here on the left-hand left box, Australia's forest carbon sinks sit around 40,000 megatons of CO2 equivalent and that 
uh, small changes in this forest carbon stock can be large compared with Australia's CO2 emissions. And the question really is, uh, in a changing climate and with the potential for increased occurrence of megafires, is there the uh, chance that we could lead to a, have or be experiencing and be seeing a gradual decline in uh, our carbon stocks in the forest? So that's the big picture. I know land managers are more concerned with the immediate impacts of fire and uh, some of the decisions about how to burn and when to burn. So we'll move on to some of the practical aspects of the project. Uh, when we started the project, most of the knowledge of carbon in forests is, uh, is associated with the carbon of stems because that's been the merchantable part of the forest. So we've developed quite a good knowledge of the amount of carbon in uh, productive forests and in forests that are important for forestry for timber extraction. But our knowledge of the distribution of carbon across the different uh, carbon pools in the forest has, um, uh, has not developed it at the same scale as the commercial understanding of carbon in stems. So when we started this project, we found within the literature and a range of uh, agency reports of reasonably good information on the amount of carbon that was susceptible to loss and emission in the litter layer, but a more fragmented understanding of the distribution of carbon across the other important aspects or the other uh, areas of the forest that burn, being understory bark and uh, coarse woody debris. Now, fire managers have understood this, and our aim really has been to try and uh, help them to uh, come to a better understanding or, or knowledge of all the carbon pools that are potentially impacted by fire. So the, uh, overall, the fire impact on these different uh, carbon pools is not well understood. So our, our research aimed to address the questions here, how much carbon is in eucalyptus forests? And here it's mostly the forests that are at the lower end of the productivity range. So uh, we work in forests extending from around about 200 millimetres of uh, per annum rainfall up to about 1,200. Uh, and then to try to measure how much carbon is lost uh, from the different pools of carbon in the forest as a result of both prescribed fires. And as you'll soon see, um, we uh, also had the opportunity due to pure good luck to look at the loss and to estimate the loss of carbon from one wildfire in the Aberfeldy region in Victoria. So I hope that when we get to the end of this webinar that there'll be questions coming forward on some of the practical aspects of how we can manage fire to decrease carbon loss. Okay, a, a few aspects of how we set out to um, measure carbon. Uh, we uh, put in place what are called before and after uh, measurements of carbon. We use standard inventory techniques to measure carbon in different forest pools. I'll go into in the next slide. And we uh, established more plots uh, that were uh, more plots than, than were burnt. So 52 plots were, were measured, only 38 of these were burnt in the end. Uh, but in total, in total we, uh, we made uh, a lot of measurements, and this is due to Luba's hard work in coordinating the field crews and so on. And we had terrific support from the agencies to get through what was really a lot of measurements uh, uh, involving the coordination of our measurements with fire that came in soon thereafter. As you can see, the study sites extended from coastal regions of Tasmania in the south uh, to the very dry areas in the uh, Adelaide Hills. Uh, some of the sites up there were woodland sites with uh, rainfall down to two or 300 millimetres per annum. Also some very dry sites in the Gugong area of the ACT and much wetter sites uh, just to the north of Gympie in Queensland. So quite a broad geographic range and uh, understandably, due to proximity, uh, the bulk of our measurements were concentrated in the, uh, in the Otway area of Victoria and in central and eastern Gippsland. We uh, measured carbon pools according to the uh, IPCC uh, land use change and forestry methodology so that we apportioned carbon amongst uh, the above ground biomass pool we measured it in the deadwood pool, which includes coarse woody debris as well as standing dead trees and stumps. A very important fraction that's impacted by fire is the litter, uh, also synonymous with fine fuel. Um, 
and we measured carbon uh, to 30 centimetres soil depth. And this is an important point in that uh, the uh, study enabled us to apportion the carbon that, had, that was deposited on the soil surface and how it is the soil surface organic carbon was impacted by fire of different intensities. So we did all of this on those uh, 40 or so sites. And our method was to um, put in place a sampling technique that was reasonable and that we had resources to support. And even though we were a small research team, we managed to bring in the support of the agencies, as mentioned, and we used standard inventory to measure uh, tree height and diameter, and from that to calculate volume, and then the carbon density uh, of the stand. Uh, we sampled directly ground cover and used a line intersect method to sample coarse woody debris, as well as a, a intensive sampling uh, and good replication of uh, litter, dust and soil. So the process is shown here with this series of photographs where we basically, uh, within this uh, plot uh, uh, sampling technique, measured every tree, subsampled areas of the ground cover and uh, fine fuel, and use this line transect method to estimate coarse woody debris, uh, sampling of litter, soil, and you can see here the depth of the litter layer and the associated humus in one of these uh, hotways forest sites that we started out at in February 2011, and then Luba's hard work in bringing it all together to uh, bring you the results. This is what it looks like in terms of uh, fuel reduction. This is the site, uh, one of the sites at the Gugong area just to the uh, east of Canberra. And with these smooth bark species, you can see that the major impact of fuel reduction burning is on the forest floor and the fine fuels and the near surface um, uh, vegetation that is impacted by fuel reduction burning. In this case, and across most of the uh, sites that we investigated, the fire line intensity was relatively low between around about 100 and uh, 500 kilowatts per meter. And uh, um, the sites included not just smooth bark eucalypts, but also uh, on many of the sites, some swingy barks that were more susceptible to uh, carbon loss. So here you can see uh, a different uh, site in the Otways Ranges showing a much deeper country uh, layout. Are we okay, Sue? Yeah. So there's some voices coming through there. So uh, the um, fuel reduction burning on the sites that we measured uh, varied in intensity, so that not on, on all sites there were usually areas that had been unburnt, uh, up to perhaps 50% or 60% of the area was unburnt on some of the wetter sites, whereas on some of the others, and there's a photograph here in the bottom, uh, almost 100% of the forest floor area was impacted by the fuel reduction burn. During the two-year tenure of the research and our field activity, um, following the very wet years of 2009, 10 and 11, there was uh, a drying period in uh, central Gippsland that brought about a very intense wildfire in the Aberfeldy region. And what we've tried to do in this slide is to show you uh, that we had set up within this plot, within this Aberfeldy area, uh, sites in 16 years unburnt forests that are here on the top left. You can see the red dot there uh, with the uh, uh, Eucalyptus muliriana tree, in this case, a fairly well developed litter layer. And we took measurements prior to the wildfire that measured the impact of planned fire or prescribed fire on the understory and some of the, uh, uh, and the, and the forest floor. And the wildfire subsequently burnt through this site in. Uh, in the, at the height of summer, and that's shown in this panel on the top right, and further uh, burnt the prescribed burnt forest so that more carbon was lost from these sites uh, at a higher fire intensity due to the summer months and the dryness of the site. And we were able to use this sequence of forests to give us a comparison with a nearby 23 years unburnt, unburnt forest that had not been fuel reduced and was directly impacted by the wildfire, which was of uh, reasonably high intensity, over 15,000 kilowatts per meter. So uh, some of the results we're going to talk to you later on um, 
put these into the perspective of the mitigation of the carbon loss from wildfire due to planned burning uh, immediately prior to the wildfire. So just make that point that we, we recognise that uh, as planned burning or recovery from planned burning proceeds, then the mitigation effect due to the reaccumulation of fine fuels and the little layer in particular will diminish. Okay, this is what the wildfire looked like immediately after uh, the wildfire here in these two panels on the left. And you can see that this was an extreme intensity wildfire that pretty much burnt all of the above ground organic matter apart from the uh, tree stems themselves. A lot of the bark at 50% was burnt off the trees. A lot of the coarse woody debris was burnt away. And a lot of trees were laid on the ground uh, to form new, uh, new coarse woody debris on the forest floor. You can see the intensity of the fire here uh, on the left. Uh, our colleague Tom Fairman was in this region only uh, a couple of weeks ago and shot these photographs from the same as a point uh, as was taken back in March 2013. And here we are in February 2014. And you can see the uh, reasonably rapid recovery of the above ground components of the stand, as well as the beginnings of the re-establishment of the little layer, uh, indeed, uh, in, of the fuels of the site. So, to some results. Most of the forest carbon um, in plan burning is not impacted by fire. And that's because, and the results here in the uh, graph on the left here, are the average of all of the sites in the study. Uh, sorry, they are the sites uh, that are averaged according to state and to location. So Victoria, Tasmania, Queensland. And the results are shown here with the percentage uh, of carbon within each carbon pool are uh, averaged across all of the forests. So most of the, of the carbon is inaccessible to fire because it's bound up in the uh, bowl of the tree or the overstory. And the carbon pools that are most affected by fire are litter, coarse woody debris, uh, and standing dead matter or snags, as well as the near surface understory and ground cover. And these are roughly um, the starting percentages of these uh, of these carbon pools, and you can see that there's quite a bit of uh, carbon bound up and also in it generally inaccessible to the impacts of fire in the soil. And keeping in mind that the forest sites that we've shown you in the photographs uh, a few slides back, we'd like to pause on this particular slide and summarise some of the findings. And we'll start with the planned fire. Um, but planned fire, and these are results that are averaged across the range of sites that we measured. Uh, planned fire mostly is shown here in green, and it mostly impacts the litter, uh, coarse woody debris, and ground cover uh, pools of carbon in the forest, and to a lesser extent, the standing dead snags. And these, uh, it's a bit of an unusual graphic. This is carbon loss in percentage and goes above 100. But if you read each of these different uh, hatched material, uh, hatched uh, histograms or different points in the histogram as uh, relating to 100%, then you can see that, um, that plant fire uh, has a minimal impact on these carbon pools relative to the extreme case of a wildfire in long unburnt forest where, which burns away 100% of the little layer and 100% of the ground cover. And we measured 88% loss in coarse woody debris and a 78% loss in the standing dead snag for this uh, wildfire burnt forest. Uh, it also activates a much greater loss of understory, particularly the smaller size understory components and a much higher percentage of elevated bark. The intermediate case of wildfire after planned fire uh, is, uh, well, sorry, the case of wildfire after planned fire is intermediate between these two extremes. So we'll just try and put that into perspective uh, in the next slide again. So carbon losses in wildfire can be high. Um, and in our case, and using purely the empirical data that we managed to assemble from the field studies, we found a 40% greater loss, carbon loss, following wildfire 
in the 23 years unburnt forest and this is the punchline compared with planned fire loss plus wildfire after planned fire which are these two uh, these two uh, boxes on the histogram here so if we assume that planned fire doesn't prevent wildfire from burning through that forest then we can assume here that the losses here were 5 plus 14 which is roughly 19 tons of carbon per hectare uh, if we assume that the planned fire prevents the wildfire from entering the forest through some way, uh, through preventing the spread of the fire, then the mitigation effect is five tonnes of carbon loss versus potentially 31 tonnes of carbon loss per hectare. Um, if we multiply these numbers out um, and assume that wildfire releases this number here, roughly 31 tonnes of carbon per hectare, and we say, for example, that 600,000 hectares of forest is burnt in wildfire at this sort of intensity, so roughly half what uh, the forest area burnt in 2003 and 2006 7 in Victoria in each of those events, um, then this is equivalent to about 10% of Australia's annual CO2 emissions, just purely by multiplying out this number. Uh, a few other things that we discovered along the way that may be of interest to land managers that people may not have thought of before is that as fire intensity increases, uh, more forest floor charcoal is consumed than is created. And some of this uh, data is only um, uh, uh, being completed at the moment and will be published in the next couple of months. But some of the uh, some of the work that uh, Luba was involved in as well as the uh, PhD students uh, who are yet to um, present their results has clearly shown that the greater charcoal production after wildfire in fuel treated forests um, than in wildfire forests. So this photograph here on the bottom shows the impact of wildfire on the forest floor, which is pretty much reducing all of the little layer and organic materials and indeed of the larger pieces of charcoal in that forest floor to ash whilst in the planned fire or lower fire intensity forest, you get a greater percentage of carbon redistributed or being created in long-lived charcoal of larger piece size. And we've tried to show you some of the empirical data that supports that conclusion here on the left, where uh, we've got the organic material and charcoal on the forest floor following planned, all the planned burns that we measured is roughly just over a ton of carbon per hectare. In the wildfire, uh, in fuel treated forests, um, following wildfire in fuel treated forests, which is of much lower intensity than wildfire in long unburnt forest, then there's roughly double this amount of charcoal carbon produced, long lived carbon. Whereas in the wildfire site, um, you, uh, you get the carbon produced initially, but then it's burnt away to ash. The if we summarise the carbon losses as a percentage of above ground biomass in this case, then across all of the sites that we measured, the average loss of above ground carbon in planned fire from the 40 or so sites was around about seven tonnes of carbon per hectare. And uh, we're in the process of trying to relate the amount of carbon loss with the fire conditions themselves and also with the nature of the forest but one thing that stands out is that uh, carbon loss as a percentage of above ground biomass is highest in the lowest productivity forests. And this is because the forest floor and litter layer contributes more to total forest carbon in lower productivity forests than it does in high productivity forests. So it means that lower productivity forests are more susceptible to carbon loss than the higher productivity forests. And uh, this was seen in particular at the low rainfall sites of Gugong in the Adelaide Hills and uh, on the coastal sites that we measured down in Tasmania. Uh, for the, uh, I guess you'd say, typical open forests of uh, Eucalyptus obliqua and um, similar species, carbon losses really were between around about 3 and 5% uh, of above total above ground biomass. So what does it all mean for emissions estimates? Um, we, we think we have reasonably good idea now of the impact of planned burning on 
carbon loss overall. And not all of the carbon um, that is impacted by fire is emitted from the forest site. Some of it is redistributed to the forest floor, as I mentioned, as charcoal and uh, other sort of partially burnt organic materials. But along the way, when we uh, looked at the national method for estimating emissions from forest fire, uh, we quickly realised that uh, it was the litter data of which uh, we had the best idea of initial mass in forest had been informing emissions estimates. And most emissions estimates were based purely on the litter component of, uh, of fuel. Um, now that we have a better idea of the spread of carbon across a range of carbon pools in the forest, uh, we're aware that coarse woody debris and snags in particular can contribute significantly to emissions. Um, so the um, emissions based purely on litter and an estimate of total fuel loads based on litter uh, underestimate carbon emissions from forest. So you can see here on the right hand side uh, how uh, a couple of photographs from one of the sites in Gippsland showing this large dead tree here in the, uh, uh, in the middle ground of the photograph right across the measurement plot for fire. And this photograph taken from the same position following in this case the fuel reduction burn. So this isn't wildfire, this is fuel reduction burn. And you can see that that fuel reduction burn burnt away pretty much all of that piece of coarse woody debris or that log, uh, probably because it was dry enough to smolder for perhaps days or even weeks afterwards to, uh, to release the carbon, but also uh, uh, coarse woody debris smoldered to release some of the more potent greenhouse gases, methane in particular. So if we nuance or adjust the national estimate for emissions from fire to include uh, a coarse woody debris component that include that increases the fuel load from which uh, carbon is released as well as shifts the greenhouse gas emission profile more to methane, then we find that um, emissions uh, are underestimated in the current methodology and need to be revised to a more realistic estimate based on this information. So the current methodology underestimates forest emissions from fire it's important to, to stratify emissions by fuel size, class and type for the reasons uh, we just outlined because of the different greenhouse gas profile from the heavier fuels and the fact that they burn over much longer periods of time. And uh, some of uh, uh, Luba was very uh, persistent and, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <clears throat> and um, uh, insightful in enlisting the interest and in the uh, collaboration of the CSIRO team of uh, Mick Meyer and Fabian Risen to do some infield uh, emissions estimates from the planned burn. And we'd just like to um, finish by presenting some of um, the potential revision of uh, emissions from both planned and wildfire based on these infield estimates of emissions and revised emissions factors for different uh, carbon pools. And basically the punchline is that uh, the emission estimates based on field numbers, which are shown here in the hatched uh, histogram bars versus the emission estimates based on default numbers, which are the current um, national methodology uh, shown in black. And if you just look at the planned fire situation, then uh, the national default numbers underestimate emission from planned fire by a factor of 2.5. And for wildfire, we think that they underestimate emission by up to 4.5 times. And that's because of both uh, an improvement in our knowledge of the fuels that are contributing uh, to emissions, as well as the emissions factors uh, that we use to calculate loss from those fuels. So, um, in terms, of the, in terms of the agency, it means that the uh, estimates for planned fire need to be revised up a little bit, but not nearly as much as the revisions that are required for, um, for the wildfire situation. Go back to the previous slide. Oh yeah, so here are the, uh, here are the numbers. 
The Australian national methodology underestimates non-CO2 emissions, which is principally uh, nitrous oxide and methane, by 30% from planned fires and by 50% from wildfires. Using non-default emission factors. Using fuel-specific emission, fuel factor. emission factors. Thanks, Lula. So I think that's pretty much um, where we wanted to uh, to end the presentation of data. Um, what does it mean to land managers, and how do land managers adopt this information and use it to reduce carbon emissions from fire? Is something we'd like to deal with in the discussion that we're about to have. And uh, we're, we're aware that um, uh, textbook, textbook uh, fuel reduction burning probably involves burning the forest, fuel, forest when the surface litter is at around about 10% um, and the underlying litter is still moist so that you get a reasonable burn off of the lighter fuel layers without impacting the organic matter of the deeper forest floor. And we think that that's one way to uh, to reduce emissions in particular. So uh, I can see there are some questions coming in and we'll start to deal with them. But before we move to questions, uh, we'd like to point out that um, most of the major results of the study have been published in these first two publications that are shown here. The third publication uh, in particular focusing on the emissions and comparisons with wildfire and plant fire impacts has been uh, accepted subject to minor revisions and we hope will be available uh, within the next three weeks or so. And some of the results that we've just talked about um, will be encapsulated in this fourth publication, uh, which we hope will be available um, within the next couple of months. So Sue, we'll hand back to you for whatever happens next. Okay, okay thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, um, and and um, um, yeah, just it's really, 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 Excuse me, if there's some very big variances, and I'm wondering where to next for creating some of the awareness on this. Um, but if you want to ask a question, could you please, in the bottom left of your screen, there's a free text box. Um, and these webinars are really designed to create some discussion and certainly some interchange and an exchange of experience and findings. So if you want to ask a question, now is a really good opportunity. Um, and please use the um, free text box in the bottom left of your screen and just type something in. Don't worry about the, um, the spelling because I, I think it's a closed circuit anyway. Um, and what um, Chris and Luba will do is read out the question and then they'll answer it. So um, that was my question really as I was um, listening, Chris um, and Luba, is that, you know, these are some quite extraordinarily high, I think, um, you know, um, findings um, from, from what is the, I guess, accepted understanding. Yes, that's right. So perhaps we'll go to Gary. Um, I assume that's Gary Morgan's question first. So thanks, Gary, for the question. Uh, I'll read it out. Are you suggesting that this research could encourage land managers to better manage their forest carbon release through planned fire, particularly if Australia includes carbon release from bushfires in its annual accounting? And I think the, the answer to that, Gary, is a resounding yes. Um, we can, we can uh, encourage land managers to be more aware of the different carbon outcomes of burning at different intensities, um, which they can uh, control fairly well or uh, manage for by having a good knowledge of the forest conditions before they light the planned burn. So uh, I would uh, say that yes, uh, that's uh, definitely the case. Now, Doug, uh, Doug, your question I think you've said is answered. And and Ray's tapping a question. So Ray, we're looking forward to something coming through. What's there? These are very big area, yeah, okay. No worries, Gary. <laughs> and Zoe's tapping a question as well. 
Deborah, is there anything that you'd like to say while we're waiting? <laughs> Okay, here we go from Ray. So Ray's question is, um, long-term unburn does release a lot of carbon per event, but what about per year average? Yeah, Ray, um, your, your question really begs the question of, of what happens if we model this data, and we have um, set out to do that uh, in a simple spreadsheet model. And we think that to do the job uh, to do the job of modeling our data justice, it needs a very careful treatment because we can make assumptions about fire return time for wildfire, and we can make assumptions about how often we burn in planned burns, and assumptions about the mitigating effect of planned burn on carbon release by a subsequent wildfire. And we can jig those assumptions in different ways to get uh, different uh, carbon outcomes so that planned burning um, actually reduces the overall carbon emissions under some assumptions, especially those where wildfire returns somewhere between 50 to 100 year, uh, at 50 to 100 year intervals. But if we push wildfire out to 150 year intervals, then, and we retain uh, planned burning at roughly 20 to 25 year intervals, then they start to look as if they're on a par in terms of the carbon outcome. So, uh, it's a difficult question to answer in a definite way. Yeah. Okay, so the next part of the exactly. yes, so another question from oh, yeah. from Doug now is oh, I'll read it out to say that these results favour a policy of fuel reduction. Don't oh, hang on, hang on, it's just disappeared from view. Where's it gone? No, yeah. <laughs> to say that these results favour a policy of fuel reduction, don't we need to know how the landscape perspective, e.g. the frequency of the fire regime, how well fire locations can be predicted in advance and how many acres might be treated uh, unnecessarily? Yes, you're right, Doug, and that's why we've shied away from, uh, in this case, presenting uh, modelled outcomes. Uh, what we're emphasising is that in, in the case that we measured in Gippsland, the planned fire immediately prior to the wildfire did uh, mitigate the carbon release from the forest. Now to take those results and, uh, and then project them through time is uh, under different um, planned burn and wildfire scenarios is a complex task. Uh, Doug, I want to add that our results were like our task wasn't to favor policy of fuel reduction burn or not and our task was to actually uh, understand how much is lost what is lost and how it can be accurately accounted because so far it wasn't really accurately accounted in australia and all national emission estimates are based on data collected in 1986 as we write in one of our uh, publications for conference proceedings, I think, here. And our task was to bring in a science to the current standards. And that's it. So, in that particular event, which we published in this paper, uh, yes, prescribed burning mitigates wildfire emission. But if you took over 10 year period uh, cycle of prescribed burning, that maybe not, maybe paper by Bradstock saying that accumulative effect from prescribed burning is actually be higher than uh, once in a 20 year um, release of carbon from wildfire. But because nobody had this uh, empirical data to model it properly, that's the only the first step to do. Okay, thanks, Luba. So maybe we'll go to the next question. Uh, Zoe. Zoe? Zoe? Yeah. I'm going, going the wrong way. Nope, nope. Okay. Yeah, Zoe. Zoe, hello. I thought some of the research by Brad Stockadell suggested that prescribed burning does not really reduce emissions due to, the due to the necessity to repeat the process every five years or so, therefore negating the carbon benefit. And yeah, Zoe, we're aware of um, the, the Bradstock paper and of um, some of the assumptions in there. And it's a very carefully um, argued case and uh, what 
I think Luba's kind of encapsulated the point we want to make is that we're putting some science and some data into the scientific literature that will improve the sorts of analysis that Bradstock and others did in their paper. We're aware that the, um, that the analysis was uh, based on uh, quite a bit of um, inference about carbon losses under different scenarios because the information is not there in the literature for, uh, in terms of real numbers. So what we're trying to do is, uh, in the first case, put the real numbers for forests that we looked at into the literature and then we can move on to uh, do a re-evaluation in the same way that Bradstock has uh, to look at the outcomes from different scenarios. So we'll go to Jill next. Carbon release from forest fires is important to add into the carbon equation, but has anyone looked at the carbon loss from logging operations, including below ground carbon? This must be far more extreme than even wildfire. Okay, um, Jill. Um, not CRC for logging. <laughs> no, no, but happy to answer the question. <laughs> um, and I'm assuming it might be Jill Red, but I'm not sure. Um, the, what we've found, not just in this project, but in associated projects, is that there are very few um, above ground actions that influence below ground carbon. So that the main thing that leads to a change in, in below ground carbon is a change in land use. So it's really a, a change in land use from forest to agriculture or forest to grazing or a major reduction in the uh, net primary productive capacity of the site, in other words, tree removal, that will lead to a gradual degradation in below ground carbon. So we found that below ground carbon is very stable uh, in relation to, um, to fire. And uh, we haven't looked specifically at logging, um, but I imagine that the impact there would also be hard to, uh, to measure. Okay, so what's next? Ray, thanks. Please let me know if you want any local surveys done. Sunshine Coast, thank you, Ray. <laughs> uh, and Doug said thank you. And there's some suggested literature from Doug there, um, which I looks like Pacific Northwest uh, in terms of forest fuel reduction, alters fire severity, and long term carbon storage. So thanks, Doug, for pointing that out and providing some extra links there. Um, we're well aware of the need to, um, yeah, to, to keep putting data into the literature that can be used for modelling analyses. So Sue, we can see you again. And, uh, there are a couple more questions. Are there? Typing, the typing. Uh, am I being too keen to get away? No, no, we still have a few more minutes. We, we um, an, an hour session here, so and I can see that there's a lot of folks still on the line. So. Um, if there are some more questions that have come through, or there's still time to, to ask a few if you wish to, or contribute to the discussion in some other way with perhaps some of your own experience. We stop typing. We stop typing. <laughs> Um, I also wanted to um, let everyone know in chatting to Luba and Chris um, ahead of the webinar, they're very um, happy to um, look at um, doing some um, live um, presentations. Um, so if you are in fact um, putting together perhaps some in-servicing or training or personal development um, you know, workshop and and it's going to uh, have an audience that would be very interested in. Obviously, um, in, in 30, 35 minutes, Chris and Luba have only been able to state over the um, their findings, and um, they'd be very happy to to come and talk to you in a lot more detail um, and open up that discussion to more about how um, this information can actually be um, applied in the field. So. Um, there's two ways to do that. Um, I think Luba and Chris were going to use that free text box and um, put their email addresses in, or an email address to get to them. But also on the Bushfire CRC website, under the Research Utilisation tab, is a um, pro forma inquiry form or um, registration of interest form. And you can fill in that, that'll come to me and we can traffic that through for you. Okay, we've just added some uh, email addresses there to the text box. 
do if anyone would like to, to use those to follow up with us. And we'd be very happy to head out to some of the work centres or some of the agency um, uh, offices to, to talk through the, this research in more detail. Okay. Um, and just while we, we're waiting to see if any more questions come through, um, um, thank you both for your time. I actually found that quite fascinating because it's obviously a, a fairly new to me kind of subject, but um, um, there's been a lot of questions and some good um, discussion, I think. Um, just a reminder that the webinar will be up on the Bushfire CRC and AFAC website um, at the end of the week. Um, and along with some suggested further reading, although there's quite a bit there on that final slide too um, that um, Chris and um, Lever have put up. Um, and there's a short exit survey at the end um, and um, we'd be very happy if you could just give us some time to give us some feedback. And an upcoming webinar that we have, hopefully at the end of April, will be with Lisa Langer from the Psycon Research Centre in New Zealand. We've been looking at the effectiveness of rural fire danger warnings for New Zealand communities, so please look out for that one. Um, I don't know if we've had any more um, new questions come through. Yes, we do, and um, we'll we'll just address Lockie's question there. So, Lockie, yeah, um, uh, the question is, uh, and I'll just read out the question. But <laughs> there are big differences in in decay condition of logs in different forest types due to wood, wood durability characteristics of tree species and past stand history. Do your results show any major differences between forest types in coarse woody de uh, debris consumption? And Lockie, yeah, the answer is definitely yes, um, but perhaps not for the reasons that you suggest. Um, we, if we contrast the results in coarse woody debris consumption from the first forest that we measured in the Otway Ranges, which is quite a moist environment with the high duff layer, and there were a lot of large coarse woody debris pieces which were quite moist and which were not majorly impacted by the planned burn. So they didn't burn away um, as a result of the fire. If we contrast that with the much drier forests in the Hayfield district and Coongulla where the wildfire burnt in 2013. We showed you a photograph there of a whole log burning away essentially and we think that was related more to the dryness of the coarse woody debris rather than their wood durability characteristics but it is possible. No, no, but yeah, yeah the paper which is at the bottom here is uh, we're talking about that coarse woody debris consumption very, very well relates to forest types they are in and they are so variable as you all know more than anybody else and the only correlation between coarse woody debris consumption was found with little uh, load consumption and that only was observed if forest type specifically was addressed so, and that uh, Therefore, I think you're right, yeah, there's a quite a difference between affect, and forest type does affect course wood debris consumption. It does, yeah. So, Sue, it looks like... Over to me, I think that the um, questions are, are drying up and, and you look, uh, um, you, you now have the um, email addresses there too, this is anything that you think of later that you'd perhaps like to follow up or, or raise. Um, on behalf of everyone, Chris and Luba, thank you so much. It was a very interesting webinar and we really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. Um, so I'll close the webinar and please don't forget that exit survey and thank you both for your time. That was great. Okay, thank you. There's